All right, well, let me just give a, a little bit of background about this lecture series, and then I'll introduce uh, Dr. Peacock. The Faith and Learning Initiative is dedicated to highlighting the very best examples of inspiring learning on campus. And the Faculty Center, um, especially under former director Alan Wilkins' direction with Jane Birch, has been engaged in research on transformative teaching for many years. And I, um, uh, I would say, and, and that research has described uh, the talents and skills of transformative teachers on campus, and I think few embody uh, those talents and skills better than uh, Martha Peacock. Uh, when I became uh, her chair, when Art History joined our, the College of Humanities in our department a number of years ago, I had the privilege of beginning the process of, of what's called the annual stewardship interview, which is when chairs of a department review uh, performance of faculty over the previous year. And I read uh, Dr. Peacock's uh, student evaluations, and that was quite an experience um, because it was clear that um, she was not only an excellent and exceptional teacher and scholar, but someone whose faith touches every aspect of her life and is not hard to detect. And her students find that combination of intellectual rigor and passion for the subject matter and deep and abiding faith in the restored gospel absolutely transformative. So um, to gather together today to hear her story and her journey as a scholar of faith I think is a rare treat for all of us to learn how to improve in our classrooms and on this campus to create an environment that is for uh, an environment in which the intellect and the spirit can flourish together. Uh, Martha Moffat Peacock grew up in Orem, Utah and attended BYU as an undergraduate. Later she received her PhD from The Ohio State University and she is a professor of art history here at BYU. During her 31 years of teaching she has advised over 60 MA theses and has directed 15 study abroad programs. She has also served as associate director of the Center for the Study of Europe. Her research centers on the relationship of art to the lives of women in the 17th century Dutch Republic. She has contributed to and edited two exhibition catalogs on the Prince of Rembrandt and his circle and, and articles on uh, many, many others. Currently, she is finishing editing on her forthcoming book entitled Heroines, Harpies, and Housewives, Im Imaging Women of Consequence in the Dutch Golden Age. She also acted as a consultant for the BBC documentary The Story of Women in Art, and she has received several awards, including Honors Professor of the Year, Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecture Award, Women's Research Institute Distinguished Research Award, Alcuin Award for Excellence in Research and Teaching, Douglas K. Christensen Teaching and Learning Faculty Fellowship, and the Woodrow Wilson Research Grant in Women's Studies. She is married to Gregory J. Peacock, and they have five children and six grandchildren. So without further ado, Dr. Peacock. Thank you so much. Um, I was joking with my husband before we set the date for this talk, saying we have to, you have to be sure and be there because you might be the only one in the audience because he's leaving this next week to go up and help with a new grandbaby. Uh, so anyway, I'm glad that I'm so grateful, I should say, for all of you who showed up not related to me, who didn't feel an obligation, but I'm also really glad to have my three siblings here, which is really fun because some of this will, will be meaningful to them as I talk about how I grew up. Um, I uh, also am grateful for a husband who is there to support me no matter what because on Monday I slipped on the ice, slammed my head against the cement sidewalk, and so if I get incoherent, Greg knows he's got to come up and finish this talk. Um, but I was also nervous about this talk for a couple of other reasons. First of all, I was nervous because the assignment was to talk about myself and my own life, and I kept thinking, wow, there's nothing more boring than having somebody get up and talk about their life. And uh, 
I hope, nevertheless, <laughs> that something will resonate with you here today and that something that I say might be meaningful to you. The other reason I was nervous about this was because the challenge was to talk about my scholarly journey and my spiritual journey and how to intertwine those two things and uh, make sense of them together. And then, uh, silly me, I remembered uh, at that uh, at the beginning of every semester, I read this quote quote by President Nelson, which I think is such an, a marvelous description of what we're all about here in this life uh, in terms of our secular path as well as our spiritual path, that they're basically one and the same. Uh, he has this marvelous quote in which he says, your mind is precious, it is sacred. Therefore, the education of one's mind is also sacred. Indeed, education, get this, is a religious response responsibility. In light of this celestial perspective, if you impulsively drop out or otherwise cut short your education, you would not only disregard a divine decree, but also abbreviate your own eternal potential. So I remembered this quote, and it, and it suddenly came to me, they're all one and the same. My spiritual journey and my scholarly journey uh, have, have both been directing me on a path that my Heavenly Father had planned for me, and I really believe that. So it is all part of the spiritual pursuit then um, to become what Heavenly Father intended me to be. It's not always been an easy journey. Uh, as all of you know, life is full of obstacles and problems to overcome. But at this stage of my life, now becoming a senior citizen, I can look back and I can say, I really know that Heavenly Father was with me on that path all the way. I didn't always recognize it as I was going through those things, but I, I really believe that now, um, that he helped me to overcome my fears and to face these obstacles um, that I encountered. I want to talk to you about how I got started on my journey in terms of uh, having an interest in art history, and my siblings will relate to this. Um, I was lucky to be blessed to be born into a family where my parents uh, really believed in a broad education. And uh, when I was in the seventh grade, we went to live for a year in Thailand. And while we were there, we got to take a trip up to Cambodia to see the famous uh, Hindu slash Buddhist temples there. And uh, it was for me, uh, at my 12-year-old age, <laughs> the most transcendental experience I had ever had. One morning, we got up really early, and uh, because the temple is built on the sol solar and lunar time cycles, um, the watching of the sun rise through succeeding doorways as you're looking uh, towards Angkor Wat, as you're looking towards the temple, is just a mystical experience. Um, I had never been sort of uh, lifted into another world so dramatically uh, in all my life up to that point in time until I experienced this. And as I look back and I think about this, I, I uh, feel that this was the starting point of me being able to understand how art and architecture could inspire us, how it could help us uh, to see the world in a different uh, way and understand things in a more heavenly and eternal uh, kind of uh, uh, manner. So, uh, from that experience, I moved on to my next transformative art history moment, and I'm so glad that my siblings are here, uh, because my father was working in Germany, and so he brought my brother and my sister and I over to Germany, bought us uh, Eurail passes, and we hopped on the train and started seeing Europe. Now, I remember a lot of bad things about that trip, like a brother who always had to find the cheapest hotel no matter where we ended up. I remember walking a lot. I remember sleeping in train stations and waking up with a drunk sitting next to me. Um, so I remember a lot of those things. But 
When we got into the museums, my sister hauled out this humanities book, huge humanities book that she carried with us all throughout Europe. She would sit us down in front of an artwork and she'd start to talk about it. And I became so engrossed that suddenly I forgot that my feet hurt and I was hungry and everything else. And I knew that this was something so meaningful and that it was going to continue to be something meaningful uh, throughout the rest of my life. So now I come back to the second part of my title. Uh, uh, becoming Pekino is the first part. We'll get to that in just a moment. But the second part is a spiritual journey from the sewing factory to the professoriate. So then what happened to me? I came back. I went to BYU. I knew I wanted to study art history. And luckily, Dr. Mark Hamilton, who's now passed away, had just gotten approval to get the art history major uh, put in place. And so I, I, along with just a few other people, People, I think there were maybe two or three of us that graduated in December of 1978 with an art history degree. Okay, then I got married and it was like, oh, all right, now what do I do to make money? Uh, art history is not exactly a lucrative field. So I thought, I saw a, an opening for a worker at a sewing factory. I was like, gee, I like sewing. I know how to sew. This will be uh, a great job. But that was when my real adulthood began, was working in a sewing factory. Now, this isn't what it actually looked like, <laughs> but this is the way I remember it. It was daunting labor, literally. I thought, you know, I'll go in, I'll sew things, I'll make clothes, they'll look wonderful. But all I did was side seams from morning until night. I did side seams on pairs of gym shorts. And basically, you had a person stand behind you timing it, timing you going, OK, faster, faster, faster. And literally, that's all I did was shove material through the sewing machine doing side seams all day long. It was a horrible job. But it gave me such an appreciation for these women. It was a new community of women, different from what I had experienced going to college. These were women who were there supporting their families. Many of them had worked at this job for years and years. I don't know how. But they did, and uh, they were noble women. They were women who were doing hard work, all in support of their family. And so it gave me a real appreciation for them, for the, for the lives of a lot of women, the work that they do, the way that they contribute uh, to their families. Every day I'd wake up saying, Dear Greg, I can't go back to that job. I can't go back to that job. But I did. It put food on the table and helped us prepare to go to graduate school. So that's where I ended up next, at the Ohio State University. And um, I was also really blessed to have a husband who cared as much about my fulfillment in life as he cared about his own. So we started school, graduate school together. And it was a little bit difficult at this point in time because we had two little boys. And we had to juggle class schedules and we had to juggle TA schedules and all of those kinds of things. And literally, right, Greg, it was I would meet him at the door with a child under each arm, say, here, and run off to class. And that's the way we did graduate school. The great thing was you never wasted time. When I got a whole hour at the library without children, I worked hard every single minute of my time at the library. Um, and so, uh, and yet we were also really blessed. It was difficult and there were obstacles to overcome, but we were tremendously blessed to receive the funding that we needed for both of us to uh, finish our programs. Um, many, many times I know that uh, I was led immediately in the library to find exactly what I needed because I only had a little bit of time there. When I took my general exams, I know that God was there helping me remember all that vast amount of material that I had studied. So I truly did feel, uh, feel, feel blessed as we went uh, to graduate school. While I was at graduate school, I also learned to be more courageous in defending my opinions, ideas, and beliefs. And I'll never forget the experience of taking a Reformation class one time. And the professor came walking in one day laughing to himself and just announced to uh, all of the class how ludicrous those Mormon missionaries are that he'd just encountered in the student union building. They didn't know what they were talking about. And so, of course, uh, 
my emotional self <laughs> immediately jumped in and challenged him. And then we ended up in this very lengthy discussion about whether murder was a forgivable sin or not. And I'm sure in the end, I didn't convince him of anything. But I was exhilarated. I thought, with Heavenly Father's help, I'd never been on a mission. So unlike a lot of you, I hadn't really had that, that uh, 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 experience of being confronted about my beliefs. But I was so exhilarated. I was like, I can stand up. I can say what I think. I can say what I believe, even when it's a so-called authority here uh, in charge of this class. So that was a, a, a great opportunity for me to start to learn that, uh, that I could do this, that I could be courageous, that I could be brave. And I really needed this in order to go on my next journey, which was over to the Netherlands, all by myself, except for I was pregnant with our third child, my daughter. Um, and again, it was a hard time. But everybody gave you a seat on the train. So that was a really nice thing. But other, uh, other than that, I just spent all of my time running around from libraries to archives to museums, gathering all the information, and then coming back and writing my dissertation. After I completed my dissertation, I ended up here at BYU. And um, it was really great to come back and be able to talk about the spiritual dimension of art again with students, which really all through my graduate uh, career, you really didn't dare say anything like that. Um, but it was really wonderful. And I quickly realized that 95% of my students were going to be female. And so it was really a great opportunity to draw close to them, uh, tell them about my experiences, but also to learn from them, to hear about their lives and to hear about their obstacles and their, uh, and their struggles. And there's no better place to learn about your students than on study abroad. And I can attest to that. I should have all the study abroad students stand up here. They are wonderful. And we get to know each other so well. And it is such a marvelous opportunity and marvelous experience. But in addition to that, there's nothing like standing in front of real works of art, not showing something on a slide, but feeling the power of something as it was originally to be seen. And, uh, and uh, one of my greatest memories is a day in Colmar when we could not, we had planned to go to church in Colmar, but the church was way out and public transport didn't start until after church had ended. So I decided we were going to have a spiritual experience that Sunday by going to see Grunewald's Eisenheim altarpiece. If you've never experienced it, get to Colmar sometime. It is an amazing work of art. As we stood in front of this piece, um, there are a few spiritual experiences that can match what I felt that day. I told the students, no note taking. We're, this isn't a test. I just want you to feel this work of art. Grunewald's Eisenheim altarpiece. I don't know that you can see it very well. Maybe if we could uh, dim the lights a little or <laughs> anyway, I'll just tell you about it. Um, is this agonizing portrayal of Christ on the cross. Um, it, his body is covered with welts where he has been beaten. There are little barbs in his skin uh, due to the whips that were used. And then these hands that are just wrenching in pain here um, as this heavy body of Christ pulls down on the cross beam. It is uh, truly a startling and emotional image. And I just started to bawl, and all the students started to cry as we expressed our own testimonies of Christ. And I, I can't think of an image in art history that more moves me in terms of being eternally grateful for the sacrifice uh, that Christ made um, uh, for all of us. And that, uh, while I was having all of these experiences, um, things didn't really begin to focus and gel for me until one day when we were with students uh, out at Versailles. Now again, I don't want you to think we always miss church on study abroad, but we had gone out to Versailles and we couldn't find the public transport to get to the church. So I decided we're going to go have a testimony meeting out in the grounds of Versailles. Now this is Versailles Palace, Louis XIV's palace, and we found a place way out here in the gardens that was secure Included where nobody would interrupt us, and we sat down to have a testimony meeting. It was a beautiful meeting, and each one of the students got up and bore their testimonies. 
While I was sitting there, I had an epiphany, an epiphany that has lasted me throughout all of the rest of my teaching career. While I was sitting there, I was listening to one of the students bear their testimony, and then, like really a flash of lightning, words from my patriarchal blessing flashed across my mind. And those words basically said that I would have, a, have significant opportunities to influence the youth of the church. And when I first heard this, when I first got my patriarchal blessing, I think I thought, oh good, I'll always be teaching in primary. Uh, but, that, but then really, a, almost like a voice uh, came to me saying, this is what God meant. This is what God intended for you. And I can't tell you the joy that came to me in knowing that my Heavenly Father was pleased with what I had done with my life and that I was able to fulfill the promises that, that were there in my patriarchal blessing. And that stayed with me ever since. And I have tried to sort of better myself in terms of the influence that I have on the youth of the church and on the students that, that I teach. So coming back to the first part of my title now um, and, and thinking about blending this discussion of my sort of scholarly and spiritual development together, um, I want to talk to you sp uh, more specifically about my own research interests. And, uh, and uh, I hope you've now been asking yourself for 15 minutes or 10 minutes or how long we've been here, um, who is K now? What is K now? Like George came up and asked me, uh, what is this? Who is this? So I hope uh, I've piqued your curiosity just a little bit. Um, I'll tell you uh, more about her, and I want to uh, let you know that for me, actually my daughter came up with this part of the title, Becoming K Now, because she is this woman who I have felt inspired by. As soon as I found her in Dutch art, um, I was thrilled. I was excited. She was an inspiration in the way that she faced her own challenges and, and the, the model that I, I found her to be. When I first came to graduate school, um, I was attracted to Dutch art of the 17th century, even though that was not, not what I had originally planned to study. I had planned to study Northern Renaissance like Elliot Weiss, uh, uh, but I got here and I was really attracted to this art. And I'm not, I, I know there were several things that played into this attraction. First of all, my mother always had Peter de Hoek uh, prints, uh, copies of his paintings uh, hanging uh, on her wall, so I remembered that. But I was I was also attracted to the society because for the first time in Western art history, this was a society that was paying more attention to women, ordinary, everyday, contemporary women, not mythological goddesses, not saints and, and Mary and so on, but real women who did real work. Um, uh, and I was really attracted to that and what spawned that and, and uh, uh, what uh, created this interest in the society uh, for these women. Okay, okay now. Kena was an ordinary woman. She was 45 years old. She was the mother of four children. She was a widow, and she had taken over her husband's shipbuilding business uh, when he died. The revolt breaks out. Now, what was the Dutch revolt about? Uh, the Dutch were under the control in the 16th century of the King of Spain. Philip of Spain. He was a devout Catholic and very much behind the Counter-Reformation, the Inquisition, getting rid of Protestants and so on. So you can imagine where you have this northern Netherlands culture that is increasingly becoming Protestant, becoming Calvinism, Calvinist, how they're going to come into conflict, conflict with their Catholic king. So eventually, war breaks out. Uh, the Spanish king sends up troops all the way from Spain up to the Netherlands, and he starts to besiege various cities up in the northern Netherlands. Harlem, the city that Canal Simons Hasselaar was from, was besieged for almost an entire year. Basically, they were trying to starve them into submission. Eventually, they do give up, but Kano comes out of this battle as this incredibly heroic woman. Um, many paintings and 
blueprints made of her like this one. And you can see she's an ordinary woman. She's not a particularly lovely goddess here. Uh, she is 45 years old, but she is heavily armed. If you can see here, she has a halberd, she has a pistol, she has a powder horn, she has swords. Um, she is ready for battle. Okay, so Kay now uh, was basically one of these women who helped to fight against the Spaniards by throwing tar and pitch over the walls and stones and so on. So much so that the historians write, the Spaniards ran away screaming, saying, the women have become men. The women are these vicious uh, 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 soldiers and so on. Um, and immediately this begins to uh, catch on, and she becomes very popular, one of the, really the most famous hero from uh, the Dutch revolt. So I thought, Man, this woman is incredible. Uh, you can see here in the in the inscription, basically, uh, it calls her uh, an Amazon at times. She's, it says, see here a woman called Kinao, brave as a man, who in that time gallantly fought the Spanish tyrant. So I was just intrigued by this woman and, and the, this incredible uh, part of history that she uh, played in the revolt. OK, so. I, uh, I became uh, then really interested in sort of following all of these images made of her. This is her as the Dutch Judith. Uh, I don't know if you know the story of Judith and Holofernes. It's in the Apocrypha, but basically the Israelite woman Judith uh, saved her people by killing the uh, Assyrian captain uh, Holofernes, cutting off his head. So basically we have her uh, recognized now as the Dutch Judith, uh, again, who saved her, her people from the Spanish tyrant. Instead of having Holofernes' head here on the table, she has the Spanish general's head here on, uh, on the table. So this woman, just an incredibly heroic uh, figure, and I became really attracted and interested in, in her life. And as I've thought about what sort of inspired me to this, uh, again, my siblings will re relate to this, I thought of my own genealogy and of a brave, heroic woman by the name of Eleanor Grant Ord. All four of us used this as a Sunday school talk, I don't know how many times, but we, we developed as a family this great admiration for Eleanor Grant Ord. She joined the church as a young person in England. Her father, when he found out, had beaten her. Um, eventually, however, she stays with the church, and she marries and comes to uh, the United States and starts to make her way across the plains with the ill-fated Martin Hancock Company. We grew up with these stories stories of this incredible woman who had essentially carried in her handcart, her husband was a captain, so he was off helping everybody else, but she carried in her handcart this 12-year-old disabled boy through most of the trek. Then, when times got really bad and uh, the, snows came, the snow came and they uh, started uh, really suffering uh, in terms uh, of the cold, she's walking one day along and she passes by a man who everybody had given up for dead and she realizes he's still alive. So she also then heaves him up into her handcart and pushes him all the way to Martin's Cove until uh, they were rescued. So I look at this woman and I think, how heroic was that? How incredible was it? And for generations after this, this man's family were praising her and saying what a great woman she had been and how grateful they were that, uh, she, had, uh, that she had saved uh, their ancestor. Um, growing up then with these stories, I developed an early sense that women were essential to God's purpose and that women could be as heroic as men in serving God. I also came to understand that they had agency and could make choices to act with bravery in defense of their faith. And finally, I saw that they could call upon God for help and that he would answer their prayers because he loved them and he wanted them to succeed. So with that as, as my sort of spiritual and scholarly uh, background, I began to just come across lots and lots of heroines in Dutch art. This is another woman by the name of Trein van Leemput. She was from the city of Utrecht. And you can see she's equally celebrated. She, uh, same kind uh, of inscription down here, that she dared to do what even the men wouldn't dare do. Uh, they uh, had decided they were going to tear, tear down the Spanish castle. None of the men dared go. So she took up her pickaxe, gathered all the women in the neighborhood, and they went and stormed 
stormed the castle. And you can see the first brick that she uh, knocked out uh, of the castle, Bradenburg. So another of these really uh, tr tremendous heroines of the revolt. But there were er uh, heroines of a different type as well. Uh, scholarly her heroines like Anna Maria von Sherman. She was inarguably the most famous woman in all of the Dutch Republic. She had international admirers. Descartes, the ph philosopher, came from France in order to be able to meet her. She had kept up correspondence with uh, royalty really throughout Europe. She could speak 12 languages, including modern European languages, but also Hebrew and, and uh, Aramaic and, uh, and Greek and Latin and so on. She was this tremendous scholar, and she wrote this text called On the Education of the Christian Woman, in which she essentially defended the idea that women should be educated. Now, at this point in time, literacy rates were about 10% for women throughout Europe, but in the Netherlands, it was 50%. And actually, this woman got to attend the university, which was something unheard of in, in the rest uh, uh, of Europe. But she wrote this dissertation saying, Educating women to be able to read the Bible was good for a society. And so she makes an argument basically saying, if you want a good society, if you want a godly society, you should train them to read so that they can read the Bible for themselves. And this, uh, this, uh, pamphlet that she had written spread all throughout Europe was translated into English, French, and Italian, and so on. Um, and uh, so another of, a, of these godly women who was called a heroine by the Dutch, they called her a heroine. This was another type of heroine, uh, an artist by the name of Maria Sibylla Marion. Uh, Maria Sibylla Marion, also a devout Protestant, saw her work as an artist as the work of God. She collected insects and painted them and drew the flora and fauna. She even went to Suriname in the West Indies in order to document all the flora and fauna uh, of Suriname, came back and published a book. But she saw it as the handiwork of God. She saw that by uh, doing Doing uh, art uh, after these uh, creations of God, she was participating uh, in, in his purposes. So all of these were godly and heroic women. Um, and uh, after I had uh, studied and learned about uh, all of these women, I had a, a dilemma. <laughs> and this was my dilemma. This is typical of the majority of paintings of Dutch women in the Dutch Republic uh, of the 17th century, um, of women in the home. Now, when I was in graduate school in the 80s, um, most of the scholarship up to that point in time in terms of history was men's history. There was very little about women. When feminists started uncovering a lot, feminist scholarship started uncovering a lot of the women, um, they uh, came up with a, a sort of explanation as to why we didn't know more about women, and that was due to patriarchy, that we'd always had these patriarchally con controlled societies, therefore the voices of women were squelched, uh, and we just didn't hear very much from them. So they, 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 in my field, they began taking these types of images and suggesting that these were images of female subjugation, that this was essentially conscripting women to uh, lowly domestic roles in the home in which they could never leave, and they basically had to do whatever their husbands told them. And, uh, and so it was a really bleak outlook look on what I saw as truly delightful paintings. And so I wondered where the conflict was coming from here. Um, as I saw these images, uh, of, as images of powerful, noble women doing work that, uh, that, that, uh, that had a kind of noble nobility to it as they contributed to the economic well-being of their families, took care of children, uh, all of those kinds of things uh, in these images. Okay, so 
Then I thought, okay, so what am I going to do about this? How am I going to, how am I going to deal with this? And uh, in part, I, I think I was against this kind of scholarship because I did have a belief, uh, having been uh, uh, brought up in the gospel, I had a belief that motherhood was a, a, a very important role, uh, raising my own children and doing women's work, taking care of family or working in a sewing factory or whatever whatever it might be, I had a kind of reverence for those jobs, for those pursuits. And, uh, and I also believe that Heavenly Father um, felt, feels that, um, that essentially all of his children are capable of agency, both male and female, um, and that, that, that all of us could have agency to, choose, to do good in the world and to contribute to society in important ways. So. Um, in my pursuit then, I realized that this was going to be a hard task, um, and, and I uh, began sort of digging into my own thoughts on this. And again, my own ancestors came to mind. Um, this uh, woman is Irma Lillian Ord Snowberger. She is my grandmother, and she is the great-granddaughter of the aforementioned Eleanor Grant Ord that I was just uh, telling you about. I also always looked on her life as a her heroic journey. Uh, she was a woman who had been born into a family with a lot of children. Her mother was always sickly, and so she had to drop out of school, and she ended up spending most of her time sewing shirts for her numerous brothers, and also raising her two youngest sisters. The journey didn't end there for her. The obstacles didn't end there for her. After she was married and, and, and started having children and so on, her husband, my grandpa, uh, Fred Snowberger, um, decided to buy his own pharmacy uh, and right at the beginning of the Depression. And so the whole thing crashed. And essentially, my grandmother worked hard every single day of her life. She used to bake cakes and take them to the, to the new pharmacy that he was working at. She also worked in a cannery for most of her life. Um, so working in the sewing factory gave me a great admiration for how really hard that, that work was. But I admire her care and concern for family and again contributing to family in really significant ways. And uh, so I, I, I looked at her as a heroic figure uh, as well. All right, so with this as my background, I thought I've got to stand up for the voices of the women in, these, in this art. I've got to stand up for what I really think is going on here, that this isn't about patriarchal subjugation. It's about the nobility of women's work. It's about the, the tremendous contributions that they make and made to Dutch society. Um, so it was a little bit daunting because both Dutch and American scholars all had this view of female subjugation. Um, and I really really knew I was going to ha have to work hard to try and make a different argument. So the first thing I did was I started looking for texts. And I looked at these, uh, I looked through numerous, numerous texts, and I found this great book written by a doctor um, called On the Excellence of the Female Sex. And in this text, he basically talks about all of the heroic women during the revolt and all of their grand and glorious deeds and so on. But he also talks about scholars, and in fact, he dedicates the book to Anna Maria von Sherman, who we were just talking about. He brings in female painters as well. Um, but he basically has this great uh, uh, empathy for women and for their uh, contribution. Um, he asserts the importance of family and home as well. So in talking about women and their domestic roles, he proclaims that the family is the fountain and origin of the republic and states that one must augment and preserve the family as one would govern and protect a city or state. He also declares that the housewife's reliable actions lay the foundation for a well-ordered society. He considers the housewife's power great and compares her domain to a kingdom. So that's what he thought about Dutch women. That's what I see in Dutch art. Um, so this was the start of my argument, but then I knew that I needed to dig into a lot of fields that I wasn't familiar with. Anthropological arguments, for example, that uh, 
the, posit the theory that when the greatest focus is on the home, the equality between the sexes is, uh, is, is most evident. Um, I also looked at social learning theory and how by looking at images of heroines, one could aspire to become a heroine yourself. You could aspire to be as grand uh, as, uh, as the, your heroic ancestress, ancestresses. I also uh, began to study political science uh, and uh, sociology and, uh, and the work that had been done on hidden transcripts. In other words, uh, things that we don't usually look to in terms of our official histories that tell us the real ideas and feelings and thoughts uh, 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 of the class that seems to be um, uh, subservient. Um, and uh, uh, so studying all of these things, I realized how much my Heavenly Father directed me to find things that nobody had ever talked about before, make connections that nobody had ever made before. And uh, when I'd start to present at conferences, they'd be like, where did you find that? And I really had to give credit to my Heavenly Father because I don't know how I find, found uh, all the evidences. But I began publishing, um, particularly on this woman, Hertha Rochman, who who does these domestic images before any of the paintings of Vermeer and Netscher and these other artists that we've been looking at. But it is this incredibly inspiring series of, uh, uh, of occupations of women, basically. In that, but they're seen through a woman's eyes. So you notice what she does? She turns the back to you so that you are invited to spin, so that you are invited to cook pancakes, so that you are invited to scrub metalware. She makes you a part of the image. So who's going to be relating to this? Women. So I figured most of the audience was for women to relate to these powerful, strong, again, I think noble women in these pursuits that take labor, that take work, but that are really honored. They're really respectful images, I think, uh, of, of women. So. I started publishing on these things, and literally, I can tell you that the that Eddie de Jong, who's the premier scholar on uh, on, on Dutch genre images, I could hear him laughing as he would write critiques of my of my articles of my work. I mean, it would be like, oh, this silly American woman who thinks she knows what the Dutch women were about. I mean, literally, I could hear him laughing. Um, and I'm and, and finally, people started to pay attention to what I was saying, and um, and it was a long time, right, Greg? It was a long time in coming. I felt really defeated most of the time. So what I'm going to read to you next is not a way of patting myself on the back, but I want you to imagine my euphoria when I finally got this really positive critique in the Oxford Review. And this is what he, Stephen Mossman said. Rejecting the idea of domesticity as inherently menial and denigratory, Dr. Peacock forms a much more nuanced picture by showing how in art and in literature, the home, the family, and the domestic role of the housewife in the management of these were lauded as the foundation of Dutch society in the period after 1650. Rather than genre paintings of housewives emphasizing patriarchal control and oppression, they offered an empowering self-image to the contemporary female viewers and reflected a sympathetic male gaze, a contemporary appreciation by men of the valuable role of women. This balanced empirical approach makes a highly significant contribution not only to Dutch art history, but also to the understanding of late 17th century Dutch society. I'm crying as I read this because I cried when I saw this review. I literally cried. With my father, with my Heavenly Father's help, I had triumphed. I had become key now. And it was such an exciting moment. And I knew that Heavenly Father had really helped me through all of these obstacles. And I felt like I had brought forward a voice that Heavenly Father wanted to be heard. And uh, so it was just an incredible moment uh, for me. So as I come to the end then of this spiritual scholarly uh, journal, I really do believe that my Heavenly Father has been with me every step of the way. He has helped me to overcome obstacles and to persevere when things got tough. As we're taught in 2 Nephi, God is no respecter of persons, and women can achieve important and great things in life and in the life to come. And I feel that spreading this message, particularly to the young women of the church, has been a significant part of my celestial mission. 
like many of you, and I'm talking especially to young, you young people right now, I have struggled. <laughs> I have been a mom, I've been a teacher, uh, a woman in the church, and life wasn't always easy, but it was well worth the journey in terms of what I have learned and the experiences that I have had. And I would encourage all of you young people that the trial of life is worth what you gain. And in this regard, I love this quote by President Hinckley. It's, it's really just one of my very favorite uh, uh, quotes. Never forget that you came to earth as a child of the Divine Father with something of divinity in your very makeup. The Lord did not send you here to fail. He did not give you life to waste it. He bestowed upon you the gift of mortality that you might gain experience, positive, wonderful, purposeful experience that will lead to life eternal. And I realize that right now is a moment in many of your young lives when you might be struggling spiritually. And I would really encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to go and get your patriarchal blessing to know what Heavenly Father's plan for you is. Or if you've already gotten it, go back home and read it again. And I do bear testimony that God has a purpose for your life. He wants you to do all in your power to achieve the glorious ends he has in mind for you. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Great to see all your study abroad kids. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Well, I am thinking about my wife, and she, I'd like her to do something heroic contribution to the society. But she has huge hesitancy, and she may not have a, like a self confidence enough right now, but maybe he. But as a husband, or maybe what, whatever group of people, how can we help people who might have hesitancy to go out and to do something heroic action? I should, you should ask my husband that question because he uh, was really very good about, uh, at encouraging me. And I think one of the most significant things that he did was encourage me to go on and get my PhD. Um, I was in a generation when women, not very many women did that. Um, and um, it was a really selfless attitude on his part to say, OK, we'll make this work and we'll do this together. But I really feel like going to graduate school, and maybe some of the rest of you can attest to this, uh, gave me the strength to say, I have my own ideas, and I, uh, I, I do have uh, a good mind, and I, I can argue my points of view uh, as I see them. And graduate school really forces you to do that because you frequently have to get up in front of audiences and defend your ideas. Um, and so I thought that it gave me the sort of courage that I needed to go on into the profession uh, of, of art history. So I think schooling and education does that to uh, a large extent. I have a sister back here who volunteers for almost every single uh, <laughs> civic uh, uh, issue going on. And she could tell you more about how um, she gets so totally involved in the causes that are important to our community. George is a councilman now and, uh, uh, and knows the importance of uh, uh, being able to gather up people, express your ideas, convince them of your p opinions, political or social or whatever they might be. Um, and so I think getting involved, uh, it, you as well, ha working for the Catholic Church and, and, uh, and foundation. Um, I mean, you were already a professor and a totally confident individual, but I do think getting involved in civic organizations helps you to gain a strength and a, a confidence in yourself as well. Anybody else of you want to contribute to that who, who do these kinds of things? <laughs> Those are the suggestions I would have. Greg? It sounds to me like you're on the right path because you're concerned about your wife being able to express her natural ability.
probabilities in some way. And I think the best that all of us can do when we find people who are hesitant is to help put them forward, but make it possible for them. Take, take things away from their lives that they, that they might be otherwise so that they can have the time, so they can use their energies, they can use their natural skills, their predispositions to go out and do it. But it's always a scary step for all of us, male and female. You just have to, you know, it's an act of faith. You have to walk off the cliff and then, and then, and then you go. Yeah, Julie. Part of the ways in which Steve's and my story parallel yours is that we did things together. Yeah. So that would be what I'd encourage you to do is to find something that you can do with your wife uh, and to walk with her in that journey and be there in the background helping push her, keep, you know, keeping her alive when she gets discouraged. Great comment. Great comment. Yeah, Sydney. Having made the case for the deaf women, don't, don't you see it in other genres of or other fields of art, French or the German or the whatever? Yes, Sarah could speak to the French. I think the French. Uh, the French are highly inspired by Dutch genre paintings, um, as are a whole lot of other 19th century realist painters who start to, to do depictions uh, of, of women in the home. Um, there's a whole long debate about patriarchy and French culture from the revolution on. Certainly women played an important role. The nice thing about revolutions, what revolts do, is they suddenly throw the society into chaos. And when that happens, all the old rules about women must do this, men must do this, are sort of thrown up in the air. And so it's a, it's a time when you can sort of reconstitute things in terms of, um, just to give you a, a sort of sense of Dutch women, not only were they incredibly literate, they had more rights than any other women in Europe. They could represent themselves at court, they could own their own businesses, they could inherit property. All you Jane Austen fans know how long it took for the English to make that choice. Um, and so it, it, it was a society where really uh, a sort of debate about how should we structure the society was set in place because it was an entirely new uh, societal structure. Um, many historians now see it as the first early modern democracy in which they were making rules and laws for themselves. Uh, and women uh, really came out rather fortunate uh, in the Dutch Republic. So not every society has that ability to sort of transform, but now Nevertheless, I do think throughout history we do need to pay more attention to the idea that women in traditional roles, in domestic roles, can also be given a lot of import uh, and, and be shown as really significant and consequential for the society, um, rather than always seeing it as a sort of denigratory role. And, and I do feel like that has been overlooked a lot. <laughs> Yeah, Lindsay. I know you've probably spoken about in the past, but what would you say were like main points of balancing your career and your family? Having a great husband. <laughs> I really do think that's, and all of you who've been on study abroad know what I'm saying. Um, uh, having a supportive husband who, again, uh, sees it as important that you're fulfilled as, as, as his own fulfillment uh, meant a lot. The first time I went away to do dissertation and research, both the kids got chicken pox and Greg had to deal with all of that in addition to my being gone. And uh, I think you both have to come together and, and say, okay, I can compromise on this. Can you, can you, can you adjust your schedule here? And we really didn't, we never had to use um, outside help uh, for our children because that was one of our goals was we want to be there for the raising of our own children. Um, but it does take sacrifice. President Hinckley always said unselfishness was the key to marriage and I agree a thousand percent. Um, unselfishness and realizing that we're all in this together and we've got to, to make this work. I would say for those of you who are still in the position of not going on to graduate school, if you can go to school together, it's a whole lot easier than when someone has an eight to five job and you're trying to fit in schooling in between, then I think it becomes a more uh, complicated uh, process. But you each give and take a little, and, and, um, and I think if you both have uh, 
those end goals of making a successful family and making successful people, uh, you will, you'll be able to achieve it. Sure. I think um, when you were doing your dissertation research and what you've dedicated your whole career to doing to, to, to um, elevating, Right, to, to find the nobility in, in what people have dismissed previously as menial women's work. How has that affected your religious practice, and if so, how? It was a really interesting thing. I don't know if uh, all of you are aware of it, but Patricia Holland gave a, a really wonderful, eloquent talk when I first came here to BYU. And it was uh, sort of at that moment when there was this great debate about working women in the church and, you know, uh, how, how do we face this dilemma. And she gave this beautiful talk about, as women, let's not criticize each other. Let's be happy for the choices we each have made. And I, I, I admire great mothers like Sidney Reynolds, who I remember when we first moved to, to Orem and into that ward, she told me, enjoy this stage of your children's life because it's going to go by very quickly. I found that such a wise uh, a piece of advice to give. And I've tried to remember that, Sydney, my entire life, um, that that time is really short. I admire women who spend that time with their children raising them uh, in the gospel, and particularly now that we have so much emphasis on family and home teaching and so on, um, uh, teaching in the home, I should say. Um, uh, I, I think I think that is a heroic role. I really do. It has given me an admiration for women who choose, choose to do that, but it's also given me an appreciation for women like you, Sarah, who go on and do great things. Sarah was also a study abroad student long, long ago and has now gone on. I am so proud of my students. I love them all. It, it brings me to tears to, to think of all that they have done. I, I am literally just so incredibly proud of you all. It's just so wonderful to see you all. <laughs> Martha, thank you so much for such a wonderful lecture and, and for everything that you bring to BYU. It's really a, a pleasure to work with you, and, and let's give her a, another <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>